Wait for the comments to let me know that we're live. Let me know I can start because there is a very slight lag time. Usually. As long as my internet is working. There we are. We are live. Fantastic. You know, awesome. the first few moments of randomness on the internet. <laughs> it's wonderful. So we are going to go live in a three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 740, recorded on Wednesday, September 25th, 2019. Science and chemistry. <laughs> Yay. Hey there, I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we're going to fill your heads with bad news, good news, and robots. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. This world should not be led by children. The fact that this week the UN put on a young girl center stage to speak on climate change never should have happened. That four million children skip school to focus this world's attention on climate change never should have happened. And the constant stream of derision from some media platforms aimed at these children also never should have happened. What should have happened and happened long ago is for the adults of this world to take the lead on the climate crisis. But if we cannot find the adults willing to do the adulting, it is at very least nice to see that the next generation will take the responsibility seriously. But they cannot do it alone. They need your help. They need the adults of this world to become much more active. They need the adults of this world to become much more vocal. They need the adults of this world to fight for this world because it's the only world we've got. And we owe it to them when we're done with it. That and another episode of this Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about all the science that we found from the last week. And oh my goodness, it was a hot week this week. So hot, so hot. Today we have a wonderful episode ahead. I have some stories. Well, um, it is climate week, so we're going to talk about some climate stories. But I've got the bad news, I've got the good news, and then maybe I'll talk about other things like Crypt Keeper wasps and your tea. Because that sounds good. We also have an interview today. We will be talking about science and comics in just a few moments with our interview guest. Justin, what did you bring? I've got prehistoric baby bottles, delicate disasters, and two and a half million years of low carbon living. <laughs> low carbon <laughs> living. You're making it sound so good. And Blair, what is in the animal corner? I have invasive toads. I have invasive fish and robots and a story about your cat. About uh -oh. my cat? You, you yeah. found out? Oh, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> your yeah. cat and your cat and your cat and your cat. You know, all your of our cat. listeners' cats. That's right. I can't wait to talk about that. You know how much I love the cats, and you know what kind of a conversation it always stirs up with Justin. Yeah. So <laughs> let's jump into all the fun. Everyone, I would like to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science... I just want to say, you can do that if you want to. Why aren't you subscribed? Oh my goodness, get in there. You can find us all places podcasts are found. You can also find us on YouTube and Facebook. Look for This Week in Science. You can also find us at twist.org. All right, let's 
jump into our interview now. I would love to inter- in- introduce our guest. C.A. Priest is his writing name. Christopher Priest is the writer of a chemistry graphic novel, Chemistry, Chemistry, high school chemistry teacher, and a STEM education PhD student. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to have you on. I would love to know, how did you get interested in chemistry specifically? Uh, It was sophomore year in high school, and I took chemistry for the first time, and I felt like it allowed me to explore and understand uh, most of the things that I was curious about, like with the world around me. And uh, while I was taking that class, I, I, I remember thinking, I think this is what I want to do for the rest of my life in oh, some wow. capacity. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a really good teacher? When you oh, were, yeah. I mean, Her yeah. name was Miss Harmon. She is uh, a godsend. Like she's the sweetest woman ever. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I love her to death. She was she was a great inspiration. Does she know what she did for you? Have you talked to her about it since? Oh, yes. Um, I would, uh, once I got to college, I would go back and visit her uh, every year or so and uh, definitely let her know the influence that she had on me. And um, and I ran into her last summer, actually, uh, which I hadn't seen her since I published Kim Mystery. And uh, so I got to talk to her about that. And, you know, she was very excited for me and was very happy that uh, that I was sort of like feeling her shoes in a way because uh, she's retired now. But, um, yeah, it was it was a great interaction. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's always I, I think there's for so many people in the sciences or, you know, the thing that you end up passionate about very often there is that there's one person or there's somebody along the line who helped you find that spark who helped you gain that curiosity and so it's it's all i mean to be able to go back and be like hey you did that (laughs) that's pretty awesome yeah how did you getting it you you you're you got interested in chemistry and then um you started teaching but how did you end up writing chemistry comics how did that get started so uh, I love comic books. Uh, I started reading comics. Uh, like, I think that was the first thing that I read was a comic book. Um, my uncle, uh, was a comic artist for a while. And, uh, yeah. So I was always around him drawing and, and doing things. And, uh, and when I started teaching, I, I saw, uh, that my students were interested in superheroes. And so I started looking into, well, you know, I wonder if there's any science comics out there that I could that I could use. And I ran into the cartoon guide for chemistry, uh, tried to use that and uh, quickly realized that it was not meant for people who are trying to learn chemistry. Uh, It's more meant for people who kind of already know it uh, and maybe reviewing or whatever. Mm. And uh, and so I. You know, there wasn't anything out there for me to use, really. So I figured, well, uh, who better to make it than me? Um, and, and so I, I started on this journey of uh, writing science comics. But the comics, I mean, there's the story, but they come with pictures. And I mean, did you start out drawing your own? Did you find somebody? Do you have a partner in crime? How did that, how did that all come together? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, at first I was like, well, maybe I'll try to draw. And um, I, I would start sketching a little bit and found it extremely laborsome. And uh, I get very frustrated when I can't get the image in my head on paper um, the way I want it to. And so I, it didn't take me long to be like, okay, I just need to save up money and find an artist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I scoured the internet and was able to find uh, Josh Reynolds and had a had a wonderful uh, working relationship with him with Kim Mystery. Um, he, you know, he did a lot of the, uh, or he did all the sequential art. And when it came to the really technical stuff, uh, he, he was, you know, he wanted to make sure he didn't mess any of it up. So he was like, I'm going to leave that to you. I'm going to, you know, just uh, draw it out as neatly as you can. And we're just going to put that on on the page. 
and that that's fine with me. I can handle the chemistry drawings, but don't ask me to draw people. <laughs> right. Don't the, the chemistry drawings are a little bit different than people and faces and hands and <laughs> yeah. aw awkward poses other things yeah um so what kind of inspiration did you take when you started writing how did you decide on a story and um you know i mean it's not just like here's a picture and here's water and this is how water is a good solvent and there's a comic book how did, what, <laughs> you know, yeah. kind of, how did you put a story together and where did you where did you get your ideas uh, so, you know, again, the, the kids were really interested in superheroes and, and so am I, like I love, uh, superheroes and, and the more I started to, to dig into, into this and try to figure out how I wanted to write it and see what I was also interested in, uh, I started to realize that most of the characters that I really like in comics are all science-based and I never really thought about it too hard, uh, and until then, until I started writing you know, the, the science comics, I'm like, wait a second, mm -hmm. like Firestorm, Metamorpho, the Metal Men, the Atom, like all these characters are really science-based and, and they're more often than not my favorites. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely started reading more of those and trying to figure out how they integrated some science into their stuff because they did have some science. I mean, there, there's certainly a lot of goofiness, uh, you know, pseudoscience, but, um, as, as I, uh, I, I looked at that for inspiration in terms of storytelling and trying to weave in uh, superhero stuff. And then for the science, um, you know, I, I tried to look at the educational comics, but a lot of the educational comics that I had read were kind of dull and boring. Hmm. Um, at, like it was, it was like reading a, uh, a, 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 a kind of like reading a textbook with just a comic book image there. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, that's not how this is supposed to go. Um, so uh, I, I definitely had to try to weave it in as best I can and play with it. And, um, you know, uh, so it was definitely a big experiment for me in, in making the comic in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. It sounds like it would be. So, uh, I mean, chemistry, mystery is a, it, it tells a little bit about the mystery at hand, right? So it's a, a yeah. mystery story. Um, I mean, you say you you took it from superheroes. So are there superheroes in the story, or is it more sleuthing and detective work that involves science? Uh, no, it, it is definitely more superhero based. Uh, so the the kids uh, get into a, an accident in a very traditional uh, comic book way. You know, they get exposed to radiation, and instead of you know being <laughs> burnt to a crisp they end up endowed with endowed with uh, um, uh, superpowers and uh, you know you know from there they go off and and fight a big radioactive monster and uh, you know try to try to save a town from being powerless uh, because they lost power from a the radioactive monster attacking attacking their um, uh, energy source and uh, you know lots of lots of cool things like you know, the, the, the superpower part, you know, I, I, that, that's some hand waving. I don't really explain how their powers work, but I explain right. how their powers interact with the real science of the world. Interesting. So, yeah, so, so as you're talking about this, uh, I get a couple of things came to mind real quick. Uh, one is uh, once upon a time life, which was this amazing BBC. It's sort of like the schoolhouse rock cartoons that we had in this country. Uh, but they had a whole one, uh, a whole series of them on biology, and for some weird contractual reason, they never have aired here, or they never aired via, via the, how P, uh, uh, the BBC would normally put stuff over in America. But I've talked to a number of people who were truly inspired by this, you know, morning cartoon that would walk them through the interactions of, of you know, white blood cells and how the blood cell moves oxygen, and just went through the entire body with great accuracy. Um, and then, and then there was also some sci-fi that I had recently listened to from like the forties or thirties, where it was a radio show and they were talking about the area that they were or used to be under a big ice pack. I mean, they're talking about the history of glacialization as sort of the backdrop to the story. Um, so just getting that stuff, that hard science stuff in there, uh, goes a long way. You don't have to be doing like you're saying the lecture with a cartoon that's like happy about the textbook. 
uh, to get these concepts across, but it does draw them in more if you make it part of a, a, a storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as, as I've dug more into, into science comics, I found a, uh, a PSA from General Electric from like 19, in the 1940s, where they were talking about nuclear power because they, you know, mm. previously people had only heard about nuclear power from, you know, the bombs in World War II. And mm. uh, now that the country's trying to use it as a normal power source and there's putting, they're putting these nuclear power plants near people's houses, people are very concerned and they just mm. think, oh, they're going to kill us. Um, so they put these comics out to, to educate people. And so, you know, science and comics goes back a long way, but you know, it, it's like a, a blip, uh, one year and then gone for a long time. And there, there's, there hasn't been like this sustaining force, uh, with science comics, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the difference between science comics that are meant to educate they tell a story but the point is to actually get real information across versus science in comics do you have any do you have any thoughts on kind of like you know you said you know part of your story it's a little hand waving you know there's no like how the radiation made their special powers happen and lots of comic books incorporate it's just kind of like i don't the science behind how Spider-Man is able to like jump between buildings and not have his shoulder ripped from his arm at the end of, you know, <laughs> when he gets to the end of his swing, you know, it's, the physics don't quite, don't quite work or add up. So, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of, you know, the superhero aspect where you, you allow a little f- flexibility. How much when you're thinking about writing your story, like, do you th- start thinking about, okay, this, I'm cool with it not being explained. And I think people will allow this to be a little bit of suspension of disbelief versus like everything has to be accurate. Yeah, so um, I, it, I I knew, you know, certainly doing superheroes that not everything could be accurate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when, when thinking about that in the story, I think I allowed myself to have... Uh, like normal superhero powers that we that we've come to accept being just as part of the superhero genre like flight and energy beams and and that sort of thing um being okay and but anything that that i explicitly explained uh the science of within the comic you know that had to be accurate so if if you start you know, if you really start digging beyond the part that I, you know, the parts that I'm explaining, like um, at one point the kids uh, get knocked into space, and uh, I show I show their atoms being uh, being energized, like they're they're absorbing sun's radiation, and they're they're the electrons and some of their atoms are becoming excited, and I actually show show the transition of the these electrons you know jumping from one energy level to another and when they come back down uh they're ready to fight the uh the radioactive monster and they're more energized and they're more powerful and they're able to you know really give the radioactive monster a run for its money um and uh you know i i I wanted to show those transitions and in that sort of fantastical way uh because it allows it to be a little bit more fun than just uh uh, you know, talking about some mundane thing, uh, and there are there are pieces, you know, uh, of of science. Well, with any topic in science, there are amazing, fantastic, almost fantastical things. It's like I can't believe that that's the way that that actually works. Mm-hmm. But to try to weave so many different topics with a with a story, just using real uh, real life examples, uh, would make it. Uh, very, very difficult. Yeah, it seems like it would. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to imagine like just the if somebody came from the future, you know, or they the only thing that's left as a record of of our educational system are these science comics <laughs> in the future. <laughs> what would a future archaeologist? Looking at these science comics, <laughs> so there's so th- that's think about our wonderful. educational system. No, no, what's really interesting, <laughs> there, what, there'll be enough hard science in it to be like, okay, all of this is checking out, right? People of the past could fly, 
Everything else is right. They got it all right, but they never explain how they flew. Wow. It would, be, it would be really intriguing. Next. I like your answer. I like your answer. <laughs> well, so, so this is, okay, and this is a site sort of thing, but I, I've often thought that the uh, there's not a whole lot of science in ancient texts that people take very seriously till the, still today, to put it sort of right. Um, but if there was, if there was stuff that just we weren't going to counter for several hundred or several thousand years, you go, well, you know, maybe there is a little something to, because there's all of this, these hard facts that they weren't even using back then. They didn't have any mm -hmm. capacity to, to create the technology that would have derived from this, but they knew these insanely complicated uh, scientific uh, things, but none of it's there, so. <laughs> But but this would but this would lead credence to the future archaeologists going, ah, you know, there's got to be some truth to it. All the rest of this checks out. This yeah. could be something. Somebody was flying somewhere. Like, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or or on the other hand, it's be like, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize flight was uh, developed that early. I thought, okay, well, it's older than we thought. Yeah. We've been doing it for years in the future. You yeah. walked places. <laughs> Under your feet? <laughs> so gross. What are these school buses? Like, what's yeah. that? Why are we yeah. hurting mass people in this big yellow Twinkie on wheels? <laughs> uh, terrible stories. When we're thinking about the uh, the good, I guess when you when you think about like the good and the bad of how science is portrayed in popular comic books, since you like po popular comics and got your inspiration from them. Um, can you think of any examples where you'd be like, oh my God, that is just the worst. Like it's just the worst example of science in a comic book versus like, this is like the pinnacle of the best. So, uh, when when I really started to dig into this, I, I made a, a website, atomicuniverse.org, uh, and started to re review different different comics and the science in them. And uh, it, yeah, no, the, there's there's one superhero, uh, Met, uh, Metamorpho, who is the element man. He's able to turn, uh, somehow turn his body into any element. And uh, it... <laughs> Sometimes uh, the writer would try to use uh, try to use Metamorpho's powers in a, in a way that was just that was just wrong. <laughs> uh, like he would have them turn into an element to do something that it wouldn't be able to do. And uh, yeah, yeah, the, there's there's definitely a lot of a lot of uh, that sort of thing um, where. You know, some fact checking could have gone a long way. Uh, I right. I was actually able to contribute to some science to uh, to one comic uh, as a consultant for, and it's a Doctor Solar series. Uh, I forgot what company That's was cool. putting it out. I think Dynamite at the time. And so the the um, the writer would send me some questions, and I would try to work out some more accurate science for him to put into the story uh but the, but there was still a lot of a lot of hand waving with the science you know the the superhero powers and all that but uh you know he was trying to trying to get it right and was asking me questions and i was able to help him help him out a little bit uh and there's a there's a comic writer uh, mark wade who has a physics background i think he had a mm. minor in physics oh, that's if i remember cool. yeah and uh he actually wrote a uh, a Justice League story in the '90s that was kind of mirroring, uh, or, or was a, a metaphor for um, quantum entanglement, which was really cool. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot of bad, um, <laughs> but uh, but there's also <laughs> some good. There's some good nuggets in there that you can that you can find here and there. Um, so I, I always think uh, Star Trek gets uh, too much credit uh, because they never explain anything, but they'll put a, a scientific name to, to something. It's like, oh, that's the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty compensator. 
Yeah, yeah we're working yeah. on there. <laughs> we're going to use a graviton beam to, to investigate. The, they would throw out these things that have some uh, scientific reference that they're making uh, that might be slightly hard to, but it doesn't go in any, you know, doesn't explain anything. It just, it's just sort of, uh, it's a hand wave of its own. Uh, yeah. Right. They'll they'll just come up with this elaborate name that that sort of try to guide you in in a certain thought direction and uh, right. yeah and leave yeah. it at that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You should be thinking these things now. Oh yeah, right. and there's there's a lot of that. Like this is the quantum portal gun or whatever, yeah. and and they'll just that'll that'll be all that they ever say about it. Oh yeah, five, five uh, eight years ago, there was a quantum everything. Oh yeah, yeah. actually, I and I should I've lost a lot of money. I invested in a company that was making quantum juice. Uh, <laughs> you can make you can make at home. Yeah, I shouldn't have invested. I was like, oh, quantum juice. I didn't realize it gotten to that point where you can have. <laughs> oh my goodness! Nope. Stay yeah. hydrated. Nothing like a nice cup have, of quantum juice in the morning. Nothing like a hundred. collapsed wave function of juice. Yeah. Still, yeah. Well, that's, that's it. Really it gives me my get up and go. It takes until like a particle and a wave. Yeah, that's right. Until, you, until yeah. you put the straw in, you don't. You can't tell what flavor it is. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Schrodinger's juice. Um. So. <laughs> So tell us anything. Uh, is there anything else that you want to tell us about this book? So you've got a uh, a Kickstarter that's coming up for your chemistry comic book. Um, can you tell us a bit about what you're trying to do with that? Yeah. Um, so uh, October 1st, I'll be starting a, a Kickstarter and it will be for a science comic that is uh, Fire Salt Slime. So these are three different comics that I'm putting together that I've written. And the focus of, of these is more grounded in showing kids how to be curious uh, and how to explore their curiosity. Uh, because like <laughs> I, I'm teaching and I'm trying to get them to look at the world around them and just be curious and investigate. And I have like this year long research project that I have all of my students do. And, you know, and I continuously question them of, of like, OK, what do you what do you want to do? What are you interested in? All right. You're going to you're going to focus on this thing. Let's learn how to set up that experiment and conduct it. And uh, uh, the kids are very frequently reluctant to 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 really take that step forward and actually investigate. Um, mm -hmm. And I see this not only in that project, but when we're doing labs in, in class, it's like, OK, you have these materials. Um, try to figure out how to do this thing. And I'm gonna give you some time to play around and uh, see what's going on, see how you could try to put these pieces together, uh, how these things could interact. And, um, you know, they'll sometimes, or many of them will kind of look at the stuff, talk to their lab partner a little bit and not get started. Mm -hmm. um, so, I've, I've written these comics to be very much more of a, a model to them, to model for them, like how to be curious or how to explore their curiosity. Cause I know they have some curiosity, um, whether they're thinking about it explicitly or not, they, they do. And so fire salt slime is definitely, you know, meant to, to target that, uh, that, that curiosity bit and allow them to, or show them, how to explore it and also to learn some content with, you know, fire, salt and, and having some fun making slime. Yeah. <laughs> because all kids need to make slime. It's Absolutely. Just a, yeah. It's a rite of passage, I think. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you leave high school, you must know how to make a gallon of slime. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's uh, also, that's a very valuable thing that you're uh, trying to teach there. Yeah. Um, there we we get uh, when we get too much into the rote system of teaching kids to uh, remember and then regurgitate some facts. Um, we take away the uh, that level of curiosity that should be involved and in going out and discovering a thing uh, on their own. And that that is a much more useful trait uh, now, that, especially now that we have Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and can have a, like just look stuff up on a phone. Eh, you know what? The whole remembering and regurgitating might not be as important as creating critical thinkers for the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. and that's all what the the next generation science standards are all about, which mm. is so cool, is about instead of testing to knowledge, testing to process and reasoning and yeah. and and giving a problem and spending a semester or a school year solving a problem and kind of framing science around that, which I think is really beneficial mm. also to make it more engaging and fun and interesting and uh, something that students might want to pursue instead of something that seems very dry and difficult. Right. And so I do think it's it's also part of this idea of injecting science into other ways of life. Science informs everything that we do all day. And the more we can take that out of the silo, the better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So this is October 1st that the Kickstarter is going to get going. And how much are you trying to raise? And um, so this is this fire salt slime. Is it it's one comic book? that you're funding? Okay. Yeah, so uh, the, the goal is going to be $6,000. That's going to allow me to print about a thousand books. And it's going to also allow me to, uh, uh, I'm going to be giving like uh, uh, 10, 10 classroom sets of the comic to various different schools uh, as, cool. as part of it. Um, and uh, mo a lot of those schools are are in Kentucky because that's most of my connections and the right. people I know. And um, uh, most of them are, are Title I schools. So, you know, the, the population that they serve is uh, very socioeconomically challenged. Um, and uh, so, uh, and there's also going to be two rewards left or that, that I've put in that uh, teachers could, could win uh, to, get to, to get a free classroom set. Oh, that's great. So you're trying you're trying to get get more of these into classrooms so that so that the kids have them available so that it's a uh, supplement to what teachers yeah. are trying to get kids to learn. Yeah. And and targeting and targeting like the the uh, kids who are who get lower grades or, or middle grades is is something I've been I've been trying to do as well uh because yeah. you know I, i've been doing a lot of research on how comics affect uh or can be used in the classroom and what kind of population they're affecting and it's come up continuously in in the little bit of research that there is out there um uh, on on using science comics that uh that the lower and middle achieving students uh perform a lot better uh with um with you with reading the comics as opposed to using some other like a something else like a textbook or even an infographic i wonder if uh, do you, is there any data on whether that's um you know is it just because the images like it's just something that is more interesting to them so it their attention their attention is on it longer or is it is is there a particular aspect of that of that graphic context that makes a difference. That's um, the, I, I'm definitely going to be digging into to more of yeah. this as I as I work on uh, writing my research proposal and, and conducting my own research. But uh, like the, there's there's uh, like a multimedia learning principles that mm -hmm. look into uh, into how students learn through all sorts of different aspects of videos and, and text. So like more simplistic artwork, uh, rather than using an actual picture of a heart, using more of a cartoonish picture of a heart. Oh, please, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> a real, it's, who wants to stare at a real heart? It's so disgusting. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, it's too gross. But, Can you imagine the Valentines? If they just had the picture of an aorta, like, there you go. <laughs> want that no it, it's it it's gross and <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't know um biology and and getting into all that living stuff uh give me a chemical in a in a in a dry lab or a wet lab yeah um, uh, <laughs> give me the squishy things <laughs> any day <laughs> the squishy bleedy things there we go <laughs> but I, i'm very much uh, more of a visual learner and and mm -hmm. trying i remember looking at the biology textbooks and stuff and trying to uh look at that to do a a uh, dissection and it was very hard to tell where they were wanting me to look i'm like this looks all messy i don't know what i'm supposed to be doing but uh you know 
uh, for comics when they when they break it down and it's much more clean cut, like I know what I'm supposed to be looking at. It's it's highlighted there for me uh, yeah. visually, and so um, a, a lot of it a lot of it is is has to do with that sort of highlighting effect, whether it be visually or or in written form. And there's uh, there, there's quite a bit of the research that backs up the conversational aspect of comics, in uh, that that triggers some remembering. And, and how our brains learn through conversation. And mm. that is triggered from the word balloons and yeah. not necessarily triggered through just reading uh, text. That's really interesting. I, I, I think it's fascinating how, how our brains respond. And I mean, you know, maybe the higher achieving students are just going to, you know, achieve higher no matter what, they're going to read whatever they're given, they're going to do whatever work they're given. And that's the way it is. But if, if you can do something that's going to get a student to achieve better than they would otherwise, because it captures their attention, it captures, and, and they're able to engage with that information. It, it's, it shouldn't matter how that information is presented. Yeah, it plants a seed. This is this is something I've always thought of doing is taking little portraits of Einstein as an example uh, and burying them in sandboxes. So some kid finds this at age five or six and goes, Who's look what I found. And crazy mom's like, looking what do you got there? Oh, that's Einstein. What? Who's that? Well, this is a scientist. But no, seriously, like, and then at some point in eighth grade, they're talking about physics maybe for the first time. And they're going to talk about Einstein, and the kid's like, "Oh, I know that guy. I, I don't know how, but I'm really interested." Or maybe like, "I remember I saw that picture, and I went and I, like anything that plants that sort of seed." So when when they go forward, it's not uh, it's not that um, foreign to them. I mean, if it turned out, like, yeah, that uh, general relativity was created by Bert from Bert and Ernie. A lot of kids would be like, oh, I know that guy. Now I want to learn all about this work he did, aside from the fact that it was entertaining before. Just planting that seed that builds that interest that when then people, uh, when uh, kids grow up, they see it again. There's a feeling of familiarity and not an uh, off-putting. Because there's a lot of weird words in science that can throw people off just in pronouncing really? them on day one. You know, like that can't, that, get that hurdle out of the way. Get the basic concepts out of the way. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would like to see uh, Big Bird come up with uh, you know the theory of relativity and see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Sesame Street does general relativity. Would <laughs> be And then you have the Grouch popping out of the trash can occasionally, getting all cranky about the Higgs boson what, and what about black holes? <laughs> yeah, pops back in and out of this guy. Basically, what that garbage can is, it's a black hole, right? It's a black yeah. hole, right? It's, it only takes up this much space, but there's the elephants down there, and there's a pool, and there's all kinds of yeah, there's a whole bunch. And, of and then you have Schrodinger oh. Snuffleupagus. Is he real or not? Yeah. Right. I don't know. Oh my gosh, I'm, 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 we could start writing this right now. I know, <laughs> Sesame Street, we're coming for you. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Okay, Chris, do you have a link for the Kickstarter yet, or is that something that will come on October first when the Kickstarter starts? Yeah, that will come October first when okay. I when I start it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we can link to your website, Atomic Universe, um, for uh -huh. on our website to help you out there to remind people. Um, but definitely send me a tweet to let me know so I can share with our audience on October 1st so awesome. that they can uh, keep keep in touch with you and maybe help you with this Kickstarter because this sounds like a great idea. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. I definitely will. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you want people to know about chemistry, comics, your Kickstarter? Before um, we go? I, I, I don't know. I love them and I'm going to, I'm going to keep making them and uh, keep researching them and find the, the, best way I can to put uh, science content in front of students for them to learn. Nice. Um, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And Absolutely. thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. It was a lot of fun.
Thank you so much. And like I said, I will have links on our website for you to find if you're interested in more information about Chem Mystery, the Fire, Salt, and Slime by C.A. Priest. We're going to take a short break right now and come back in a few more moments with all sorts of science with This Week in Science. Stay tuned for more once I find my music. There we go. We can explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods are hypothesis and patients are the only things I need. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you for joining us for this episode of This Week in Science. I am so glad that you are here with me. And I do hope that you will listen for a couple of moments as I tell you about ways that you can support This Week in Science. That's right. We are listener supported. If you've noticed, there's no advertisements on this show. We are completely listener supported. And so that means if you like the show, we could really use your help keeping it going. Anything that you're able to give is fantastic. So we have links on our website, twist.org. We do, we do, we do for, dun, dun, dun. You know what we love? The new twist calendar. Let's make sure I can get it there. That's right. We are now open for pre-orders for the new twist calendar. So if you have seen Blair's Animal Corner calendars in the past, now is the time to get your pre-orders in. Go to twist.org and you will be able to click on the pre-order link, the picture of a wonderful frog. There's a beautiful stained glass image of the cover of the Blair's Animal Corner calendar for 2020. That's right, get your pre-orders in now so that we can send them to you for the holidays. It'll be fantastic. Yes, twist.org. While you're at twist.org, checking out and getting your calendar pre-orders in, you can also subscribe to Twist. That's right, you can click on the orange button to be able to subscribe to Twist. You can click on our Zazzle store link. If you'd like to find other Twist merchandise over at the Zazzle store link, there are images of, there are, not images, there are products with images from past Blair's Animal Corner calendars. So you can head on over to Zazzle.com, get yourself mugs, t-shirts, hats, tote bags, other lovely things with images from twists and also from the calendars of past years additionally you can click on the patreon link that patreon link will take you to our patreon website which is a crowdfunding website for artists and creators podcasters like us you can click on that patreon link and choose your amount of support how much Will you support us each month? If you support us at $10 or more a month, that level and above, we'll get you thanked at the end of the show by name. Anything above $10 will get you thanked by the end by name. Starting October 1st, it looks like we're starting something October 1st. Also, anyone who subscribes or is subscribed already at the $50 a month level will get a framed piece of art from Blair's calendar the original artwork that's right so the $50 level normal normally gets a piece of artwork but this year that piece of artwork will be framed so for three months if you support us at that $50 level starting on October 1st we will send you a framed piece of art that will be on Patreon and that's starting October 1st I hope to see you join that $50 level for a little while it will help us to be able to to uh, raise the money we need to get Blair a new computer. That's right, we're splitting the cost there. And some of you have already sent in some donations there. Thank you very much for your support. And uh, we do appreciate that. And we're, we're going to get Blair a new computer. It's very exciting stuff. Okay. All right, all right, all right. All the things. Um, if you've seen it, oh, there, Blair's showing off some un- uncolored artwork 
still needs to be made pretty for the calendar. It's still in process. Blair, are you going to be done in time for 2020? Yes? Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I just finished two more pieces today before the show started, so um, it should not be a problem at all. This thing should be in production um, definitely by the end of October, which will give us plenty of time to make sure that it all gets to all of you by the holidays. By the holidays! Yes. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't told anyone about Twists, don't keep it a secret. Tell us about, tell someone about Twists today. Thank you for your support. We really could not do any of this without you. Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. A new conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things that happen. And we're back with more this week in science. Oh, yes, we are. And it is time for. This weekend, what has science done for me? Lately. Oh, lately. What has science done? What has it done? This week, we have a letter from, it's a long letter. Let me see if I can get down to the, oh, the I've got, I've got to move my screen around. Or maybe I should just read it off of the other screen where I can actually read it. Maybe that's a good idea. Here we go. All right, we have a letter from Fernando. Fernando this week writes in, what has science done for me lately? Today I went to the store to buy a very ubiquitous item in the Western diet. It is an off-white nutri nutrient-rich liquid that goes well with cereal. Just your typical purchase. Nonetheless, it made me realize how much we owe to nutrition and food sciences. Because the product I bought was soy milk. Fernando, you mean soy juice. Anyway, yeah. this milk, year, soy milk. I became a vegetarian mostly for environmental reasons. Yay! Yeah. And without science, I would not be able to keep my body functioning properly. I would most likely suffer from weakness and muscle loss from the acute lack of protein. I would have had severe vitamin B12 deficiency, critically low iron, magnesium, and zinc levels in my blood, not to mention the brittleness of my bones due to an inability to absorb or fixate calcium. Today, it is well known that a plant-based diet can avoid all these shortcomings and provide a healthy source of all the nu necessary nutrients. But of course, we understand this only because of all the knowledge that we have accrued over the course of history, such as identification of nutritious species from poisonous ones. That's a big one. Don't eat poisonous mushrooms, kids. Domestication a lot of, lot of trial and error that went into that, by the way. It is. Domestication, domestication of crops, development of food preservation, industrial large-scale production, standardization of acidic conditions, enrichment and fortification, determination of nutritional content, genetic engineering, and molecular enhancement. And that's not even all of it. All these advances and many more allow me to make better choices about what to use to fuel my body while considering the impact that my decisions have in our planet. And this happens three times a day. Science is what makes a balanced, plant-based, sustainable diet possible. And who knows? If this trend continues, maybe science will develop even better and more efficient ways of putting food on our plates with an even smaller ecological footprint. For now... I'm happy cutting back on my consumption of animal products. It's an almost ins insignificant price to pay compared to all the discoveries and technological leaps that have had to occur to reach this point, and it is all well worth it. I love the show, and I'll forever, and I'll be forever aghast by your <laughs> diligence, passion, and commitment. Thank you so much for bringing to my life reasons to be joyful hopeful and motivated to keep participating on this joint effort that is science your number one mexican minion fernando Aww. thank you fernando, thank you, fernando. That was beautiful thank you so much fernando 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Twist. Thank you for bringing us yeah. into your life every week. And thank you for writing. And yeah, food science, nutritional science. There, uh, There is so much that we take for granted every time we go to the grocery store, every time we open our refrigerators, go to a yeah. restaurant. It's There's that so whole, much. no GMOs for me, thanks. Uh, well, um, <laughs> the thing is, uh, your grocery cart would be pretty empty is yeah. the thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, it's, and it's a good point, too, that uh, you know we have not felt the result of the imminent starvation, mass starvation that was going to take place for a population much smaller than the world has mm -hmm. today uh, that um, after things like canning and freezing and transportation, uh, food science took up the challenge and worded that off. So people may not realize that there was a massive, horrible thing heading the planet's way that food science uh, took care of in labs across the world and we never saw the consequences of it. But yeah, yeah. it's hard at work keeping many of us on the planet uh, at once and alive. And it's going to get harder. Mm. Yeah, there's more that work needs to be done. Absolutely. There's always more, more humans. Yeah. yeah. More people, more food needings. If you would like to write in with a what has science done for you lately, story, thought, song, sonnet, some words, please send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or a message on Facebook. Will do. Justin, wait, no. No, 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 no. no. Is, you yeah, it's your turn. Yeah. I is, just go, I'm doing this the is, normal. This is the guest it, rundown. It's the yeah. guest rundown. We had a guest. So I'll start with the news then. Let's start with the bad news. Uh, this, this, <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah, this week, bad news. Uh, yeah. We all know it's, I hope you know, realize it's, it's climate week, which means there is a United Nations General Assembly and they're talking a lot about climate. And a report came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are scientists who are bringing together an, an analysis of the most current research, all of the research to date on climate change. And it pretty much said we need to get a move on. Mm -hmm. Everything's not, things are not good. Um, if we do not get nations to agree to reducing their carbon dioxide emissions, we will most likely experience uh, extreme warming above pre-industrial levels, which apparently, according to some news, we've never had these kinds of carbon dioxide or levels or temperatures associated with them in human history. Yeah, that's, uh, did you bring that story too? Because I got that one. Uh, yeah, no, that's just, a, I'm just making, yeah. I'm not talking yeah, yeah. about it. I'm just, I'm just referencing no, 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 no. it. You can yeah, talk about it. The entire evolution of modern humans took place in a low carbon environment. So we we're yeah, tweaking dials that we got no idea what the effects, well, we actually mm -hmm. have a pretty good idea. Maybe yeah. The There's still unseen effects to come many unseen effects to come and the new special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a cl changing climate is available from the IPCC and it stresses that the oceans are stressed that things are moving a lot faster in the oceans than we uh, thought they were and one of the big problems as we have talked about on this show before is the potential for oxygen level declines the ocean is already starting to uh, it deoxygenate, deoxygenate. It, its oxygen levels are reducing. Mm -hmm. And so this is the bad news. The bad news is that we really need to get started. The, um, the good news. And, and uh, can, can, one second, can I stay on the bad news just for a second? You want to stay on the bad news? Okay. Just we're going to just get the bad news out of the way. Yeah, okay. So let's do that. Okay. So, so, uh, the, the girl who was uh, speaking before the UN. Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. Uh, is about the age of this show. 16. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> actually, yeah, where the show itself is a little older. But uh, we've been talking about global warming since the beginning, inception of this show. Yep. Uh, the, it, this is not the get the move on as the conclusion uh, is kind of irritating. 
because the, the move <laughs> should have been on a long time ago. And the, the idea that we need to get the move on uh, is not uh, dire or uh, assertive enough of a statement. Uh, we have to uh, enact retroactively things we should have already been doing. Well, and I, I think the big difference to kind of segue into the potential good news that Kiki might have is that um, it in the short amount of time that I have been working in environmental education, which for my age is longer than the average person my age, but still has not been that long. I have seen a huge difference in the way people talk about this. It is not a, oh yeah, and also, have you heard about this climate change thing? Um, oh yeah, we have other worries. Then there's also climate change. Yeah, but there's so many other stuff going on. This is becoming a priority issue. This is becoming a thing yeah. that people talk about everywhere at the dinner table, at school. Um, mm. And so I think that is really the, the big shift that we are seeing right now, even just in the past couple of years, that has a huge potential to completely change the way the world responds to this issue. And so I think what you're getting at, um, at Justin, is totally right, is that we've known about it for a long time, and if it's been time to start for a long time. But I think where we're at right now is it is time to make it the number one priority. And I, I do have to say that for years, scientists have been talking about it. We've been talking about it. Other media outlets have been paying it some service through the years, but it hasn't gotten the media attention that it has needed. Now, I'm going to say thank you to Greta Thunberg for becoming a story that the media wants to tell. And it has put her in the spotlight and made her a spokesperson and she is stepping up to the plate and, and going with it uh, because this is something that she's betting her future on. Um, but it is the story of so many children who look at the future and are afraid and they don't know where it's going mm -hmm. to go. And they're having dinner table conversations with their parents, maybe about the fact that North America has three billion fewer birds than it did in 1970 mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. birds are decreasing. Hey, birders, your what? passion is dying. <laughs> is that why every bird on my little app is now rare? When you yeah. do bird sighting, it tells yeah. you like- They're all rare people. now, that's right, so, yes. Okay, that explains it. I'm like, there's a lot of rare birds in this area. It's only yeah. recently that they became so. Yeah, researchers from Cornell University documented uh, hundreds of species of birds, populations of 529 species. They used long-term bird monitoring database, databases, and they found that the number of individual birds across all the species decreased by 29% from around 10 billion in 1970 to just over 7 billion in 2017. And so on its own... Okay, that's a big decrease. But then we start talking about the decrease in insects. We start talking about the decrease uh, that other plant species that are dying. There are many things that are changing in the world. So, so let's talk about some of the good things. I was just going to say, I wonder if those are correlated with the use of uh, pesticides. insecticides. Yeah. And yeah. and the, uh, the increase. And in, I wonder if there's a correlation between the decrease in birds and the increase in cats. There you go. I knew it was going to come in some point. <laughs> I knew well, it was I mean, but I, I'm not going to argue with you on that. I will say if you're a cat owner. Oh, no, it's that oh, the hour. If, you're, that a the cat, hour if you're a cat if you're a cat owner. Hour, get rid of your cats. That's what she was going to no, say. No, no, I can your answer. I can finish it. Birds. Hold on, hold on. If, if you're a cat owner um, and Kiki's still muted, um, keep it out, keep it inside or put it on a leash. Yeah, yeah, really. Uh, indoor cats, it's your uh, responsibility to prevent them from decreasing uh, the birds. And, Any further. And, and contracting and, uh, and being a vector for toxic. Right. So let's move into the good news, right? Okay. Wait. Good news about the climate. I want, I want, we've talked on the show many times about the bad news makes people feel hopeless. Like there's nothing we can do, right? Um, the, what can I do? Who am I? I'm just one person. Well, you are just one person, but 
you can have a role and it, it helps to think about things that are positive that are happening around you. So for instance, uh, just today, a company named Intuit, who is behind QuickBooks and other software, TurboTax, you yeah. might be familiar with, very popular software uh, company. They have partnered with Project Drawdown to make a promise to what they say is uh, become climate positive 50 times by 30. And this target means that they are going to try to surpass carbon neutrality. So where while most companies and c governments and institutions are maybe trying to become carbon neutral, they say that they, through conversations, have become very aware of the the ramping up of climate change that is occurring and that they are going to make an effort by 2030 to re reduce their carbon emissions by 50 times greater than its current carbon footprint. So they're going to, yeah, they're making a promise and mm. this is something that uh, they're, they've talked with the employees, the, like, it, the company feels that this is something that they need to do and they are signing on to the United Nations Global Compact. So they are making a promise that they're going to do this. And so this is one place where industry, where you as maybe a, an employee, maybe you can start talking to people. Maybe you're a business owner. Maybe you can start having conversations with the business community you're in, with the company you work for about ways that your company can not only move toward carbon neutrality, but even go beyond that. And it's really exciting to see a group like Intuit making that kind of pledge. And uh, beyond that, uh, Project Drawdown has also started a new organization underneath its umbrella, which is called Drawdown Labs. And the whole purpose of Drawdown Labs is to work with organizations to help them develop their strategies for reaching these targets so that the, these companies aren't doing it on their own, but actually have... Um, help from within the industry. Um, other good news, Greta Thunberg is a spokesperson and there's a story being told. I love that. And if you haven't seen her uh, her speech to the UN General Assembly, we'll have a link to it on our webpage. Costa Rica has been named as the country's 2019, not countries, the world's champion of the earth. For all, it, that is the UN's highest environmental honor for everything that Costa Rica is doing. Costa Rica had decades of deforestation. More than 50% of the trees in Costa Rica have been restored through efforts within the country. 70% um, of all buses and taxis are expected to be electric in about 10 years by 2030. Full electrification projected for 2050. The country is trying to achieve net zero by 2050. Wow. They are going to reform transportation, energy, waste, and land use. Nice. So that it can off so it can deal with it. This is a small country with only about 0.4% of global emissions, but this is the kind of leadership and inspiration that so many other countries can take. This is a country that realized it can create a template for others to follow. And so Costa Rica. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Let's more countries be like Costa Rica. And then uh, there have been questions about whether or not we can phase out fossil fossil fuels. There's this this argument because Fossil fuels, when you burn them, they're dirty and they put sulfur dioxide and other aerosols that are reflective in the atmosphere. And those reflectant aerosols reflect sunlight and they do contribute to global cooling. And there's been this argument, we can't quickly phase out fossil fuels because if we do, we'll warm up faster. Oh, I, so I have one. I have one. Ice yeah. also reflects sunlight. Yeah. So when you melt the ice caps, that also reduces the albedo. Um, so. Right. But with just with it, not talking about the ice, but if we, you know, yeah. okay, we reduce fossil fuels 
all of those sulfates end up out of the atmosphere. No more reflective cooling effect. So global warming happens faster. The ice caps start melting faster. None of this is good, right? So mm-hmm. you'd go, hey, maybe we shouldn't reduce our fossil fuels as quickly. Well, scientists decided to look at this with data and oh. a simulation. They created a model to actually model vari- various um various effects of sulfates in the atmosphere and reductions in fossil fuels and how things would turn out. The models say that it's really not because we aren't going to be able to realistically, dramatically drop our fossil fuel use globally and fast enough to offset those aerosols. It really, this argument doesn't hold water. Uh, And also (laughs) we've been, and the second point is, We have been globally instituting clean air policies and regulations that reduce sulfates in the air already. Mm. So we've already started the aerosol reduction. So let's just get rid of the fossil fuels, people. There's no argument against it. (laughs) This is sounding very much like the smoke a cigarette, it's good for your lungs kind of thing. Like, no, but you want that junk in the atmosphere. It's good for you. So, you know, just, uh, geez. All right. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, I've heard this argument before and I've just kind of been like, what? Why wouldn't we want? No. So now, honestly, there is um, there's some scientific research modeling these uh, these scenarios with with and without sulfate molecules drop in aerosols to see how they would turn out. And the re- this is published in Nature. And uh, the researchers just just say we sh- we should just move forward <laughs> research says let's you're wrong decreasing <laughs> the fossil fuels folks <clears throat> we need this to be more like the uh the world war ii war effort you know, where, yeah, where where everyone mobilizes yeah everybody across the country was called into action look if you have an old bed frame in your garage we need the metal we need the metal from that. If you have a candy turning device and it's made out of brass, we need that brass. We need everybody to go to, through the garage, through their belongings, take anything that's got metal in it and and turn, allow us to recycle it into the mobilization and the war effort. Um, we need something like this. If you have a combustion engine, be it a lawnmower, a generator or a vehicle that is old and could be replaced uh, with an electric vehicle. Turn it in uh, for the the effort. I mean, this, we really are at that point, and we wouldn't be at this mm-hmm. point if, if again we had reacted yeah. long ago. So, so it, to that point, we Justin, didn't, actually, so I heard it. I heard little last bit of hope before we move on. I heard Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, today on an interview where he said he plans to turn the six hundred thousand electric cars in California to five million within. Oh gosh, I think he said by twenty thirty or something like Ten that, years. which Let's would absolutely it. mean you would have to mm-hmm. do a trade in on combustion engine vehicles. And so I think mm-hmm. it's that sort of. It's the only way. It's, Ultimately, you need government involved in order to do that sort of thing. And that is the really big difference, right, is that science was staying out of politics for so long. It didn't seem like the place for it. And now we are recognizing it specifically with this issue and some others. You have to you have to mix them. Yeah. You have so, to figure it out. And we, we did this under uh, under the Obama administration when we had a physicist as, as the head of the Department of Energy. Yeah. Uh, where there was a determination that one of the ways that we Stephen can even increase... chew, right? Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, one of the ways that we could increase fuel efficiency dramatically and very quickly was what ended up being the cash for clunkers uh, thing, where people could turn in vehicles that had poor fuel mileage and get a voucher towards uh, greater than the value of the vehicle uh, towards a new vehicle that had higher emission standards. So these are the sorts of things that. You know, that's still combustion to a combustion, but it, you know, dramatic improvement in, in uh, nationwide fuel economy. Uh, we need this sort of thing. The attempts, by the way, just, this is for people who are listening who have been hearing that the, the emission standards are going to get rolled back uh, by the current administration. The market 
of the auto industry wants to sell in California first and the rest of the nation a little bit too. But it's such a big state that uh, if, if the argument is being made here against uh, the deregulation, no manufacturer is going to go along with it. They're going to listen to continue to listen to California because another administration or something else that's going to change. And then they don't have uh, the vehicles that are ready for California would ruin them. Uh, so California and Gavin Newsom, as you're saying, uh, proposing to, to increase the amount of electric vehicles and the rebates that the state gives to people who buy electric vehicles. There is this uh, level of government involvement in the war effort uh, on the vehicle front in California and on a lot of other fronts in California too, uh, energy wise. Uh, it's, it's not dramatic enough, but it has already begun. It's already taking place. And the battery technology for electric vehicles is going to continue improving. Tesla has reported that they are developing a million mile battery. So a battery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, the, the, sure. the battery itself will last a million miles, oh, not okay. that yeah. it will. <laughs> the charge? I thought you were not saying that the charge. charge will last. Like, there's, no. A, there's no trunk. Uh, there's one passenger. Uh, That's right. Uh, and it's and it's the size of a minivan. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, but no, it it's, weighs it's, a million pounds. But the the longevity of the batteries matters. How yeah. long you can go before you have to replace the batteries, especially, you know, these batteries need to be recycled and taken care of. Uh, we need to take care of that technology also. Because yeah, these, these companies are important. There are companies that specifically recycle uh, hybrid batteries and do this sort of thing. I mean, yeah. that, that's that infrastructure is becoming place. And then yeah. the fears of the price of these batteries is, is kind of overblown because of that. Because initially, I, remember, I just, this is I was in the auto industry so when, uh, when the Prius came out, and everybody's like, it's ten thousand dollars to replace the battery on this thing. Uh, which was true for like the first one that they made was actually like a million and a half. Or maybe you know four or five million dollars to replace the first one. Uh, by the time there was a six hundred thousand of these things on the road, the price was like twenty five hundred dollars. Now at this point, it's like six hundred, and I think the people who recycle it might be competing for the you know for for you having to actually pay for that. They, they want it as bad as you're going to want the new one and price wise. Yeah. So it's it's getting to the point where it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah. It's all getting better. Hey, Justin, now that we've got all these positive stories about things that are happening, do you have any science for me that you want to tell me about? Yeah, as, as though I would then bring you something not positive. Okay, so this is actually my, <laughs> this is my favorite story uh, in a lot of ways because uh, it has to do with uh, babies. And babies are awesome. Uh, this is a team of scientists led by the University of Bristol. They have found evidence that prehistoric babies – were fed animal milk using the equivalent of a modern day baby bottle. Oh. Yeah, they had uh, these possible infant feeding vessels were made from clay. Uh, they first appear in Europe in the Neolithic about 5,000 years BC, so that's 7,000 ish years ago. Uh, they became then uh, increasingly more commonplace throughout the Bronze and Iron Ages. The vessels, were usually small enough to fit within a baby's hand and have a little spout through which the liquid inside can be suckled out. And sometimes, and this is my favorite part, they have feet and are shaped like imaginary animals. Oh, so cute. Like, I want one of these baby bottles now. Uh, th this is uh, researchers, but what they want to investigate, in fact, if these were actual uh infant feeding vessels versus something that might have been given to sick people or might have been just like, I don't know, uh, a small a small cup to suckle out of in the old nets. So they used a combined chemical and isotopic approach to identify and quantify the food residues found within the vessels. Their findings published uh, in the journal Nature showed that the bottles contained ruminant milk from domesticated cattle, sheep, and goats. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you're listening to the show, please go to yeah. twist.org yeah. and look at the article because they really are little clay animals with feet. Yeah. 
They have little That's feet a... and little heads and horns. Oh my and goodness. Yeah, they're adorable. So if you if you get baby bottles today or the what's the sippy cups as the you know if you get more towards the infant age, you will see animals on these cups because kids like animals. Yeah. Every kid loves animals. Uh, this is just a thing that kids do. And they like milk. And if it's even the animal that the milk comes out of, it's even better because then you're teaching something. Uh, but yeah, so so we're not as different than, as we may have think uh, thought at some point than people 7,000 years ago in our yes. childhood. So when I was in New Orleans, I went to the muse the Museum of Pharmacy, which was this amazing little museum that had um, a bunch of weird like Victorian era and and other kind of pretty old medical devices in it. And they had a whole display of baby bottles and none of them looked like that. <laughs> They all looked kind of more reminiscent of modern day bottles. They had some sort of rubber nipple or something akin to that on it. Um, but it, none of them looked like this. Actually, th they clearly had more issues to them than this. So one of them was what later became called the murder bottle, which oh. was so interesting because it was this bottle that would stand up on its own and had a long rubber hose that attached to a rubber nipple. So you could feed your baby and like walk away. Like you would just hand them the, the nipple. But the problem okay. is it, it was, it was so hard to clean that it would hold bacteria. I and so oh. at, at one point I just looked it up cause I thought I was wrong, but two out of 10 babies would survive. Oh my God. And, on a murder bottle. So they didn't last super long, but um, that <laughs> no. seems like a way rudimentary design compared to this. This makes complete sense. It's gravity fed mm -hmm. um, and it, it also seems and, like it'd be easier hell. to clean. Um, yeah. But it, it's very interesting that there were all these other kind of funny shaped bottles that, that did not have this basic design that seems so common sense and like it would work super well handheld uh and then you you also look at the yeah the attraction element of making it in the shape of an animal yeah uh makes it so the child will be more likely to interact with it more uh, so, uh become more attached to it and it becomes a very friendly object that encourages them uh, in a way to to maybe take care of it and then and then once you've done drinking the milk you can play yeah, none of these other <laughs> bottles that I was looking at had any sort of decoration on them. They were all pretty much plain glass. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah, they were ahead of their time there with that idea. I, this, so this goes back, so this is Bronze Age. So we're going 5,000 to 7,000 years back with these bottles, with these clay vessels. So the question is, is there, was there anything before that? Like what aspect right. of society during the bronze age may have led to that behavior or was it a was it a change that was specific to that time that i mean but the, these are pretty they're they're pretty advanced and nicely made containers and so is there something more rudimentary that goes further back for some other purpose i mean um, same purpose but you know di maybe different cultural uh driving forces so I, you know what else they're, they're reminding me of is the neti pot. They look kind of like a neti pot. Like um, mini, mini netties. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so those are super old neti pots. Um, so I'm just curious cause they do use kind of the same gravity fed principle. Um, they are kind of the same basic rudimentary shape. Um, and mm -hmm. they were super old. I'm trying to find exactly how old um, it's, part of ayurvedic medicine is pretty but it would i mean be, yeah, i guess I, at least I, a couple thousand years for neti pots but i don't know yeah you know i mean how like ten thousand years what are we what was it 14 10 10 14 for agriculture is that is that about right and you know it was is that and then animal husbandry at the mm -hmm. furthest back is Maybe, or like what's familiar is maybe 11. Maybe 11, before. yeah. So if you've got goats and cows that have milk at that point in time that you could start feeding 
you're young. Is what were we doing that before then? I don't, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this. I think it's a really interesting kind of the timeline of where mm -hmm. these would have originated is. So and that's it's, it's something that they need to, that they were talking about potentially looking into next because uh, this was uh, somewhere in Europe, but they, I mean, it, it, well, they found it in Roman Greece, uh, had uh, elements of this as well. So I mean, it's if you've got a baby, they they need to be fed all the time. My mother, Whoa. she's got other work to do or other kids to care for. There's got, somebody else can step in with one of these. Grandma can go milk a goat into the little baby bottle netty animal figurine thing and take care of business. Right? This is this is not a new problem. Go milk a goat, Grandma. <laughs> yeah. It is time for us. To move forward, this is This Week in Science. You know what time it is now? What time is it? What time could it be? It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair? Oh, she's here. Yeah. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? Oh my goodness, I have a whole bunch of amazing science news, but first, oh. I have to eat a little crow. Uh -oh. oh, don't eat a crow on the, on the show live. I, it's metaphorical <laughs> crow. In this case, it's actually... <laughs> I have to eat some gills. So in uh, on the September 11th story, so a couple weeks ago when I was in New Orleans and it was um, midnight my time and uh, I don't know what was going on, um, I was talking about how there were these snakes that were able to do gas exchange through their head, basically breathe through their head. That's still true, but <laughs> um, I explained how gills work wrong. And I, I, I thank a couple of listeners, uh, Ian and Bert, both reached out to me and let me know um, that I definitely explained it completely wrong. <laughs> so I just wanted to real quickly explain how gills work so that um, loyal listeners of the show will, will get the complete story. So um, gills actually work based on a uh, countercurrent of gas exchange. So they pull dissolved oxygen out of the water. They do not cleave water molecules. I don't even know where my brain got that from in that moment. Um, live show. <laughs> but <laughs> I know I, I was like, I said, what? So anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so there's this countercurrent. Um, so you have blood moving in one direction um, that is deoxygenated and you have water moving in the opposite direction. And so you are able to have the maximum differential um, at the far end of that count that counter current so that it pulls the most amount of oxygen as possible from the water. And so that's why, for example, um, obviously I knew that it was dissolved oxygen because lungfish and mudskippers, they live in low dissolved oxygen environments, which is why they can duck their head out of the water and breathe air because they need to get oxygen from a secondary location. Mm -hmm. If they were cleaving water molecules, that wouldn't be an issue because they'd be surrounded by water. So <laughs> um, makes sense. And that's also how the snake's heads worked in that story. So they were able to take low oxygen concentrated blood, deoxygenated blood and have it pass um, across the thin surface of the skin on the top of the head and be able mm -hmm. to pull oxygen from that. The, the part that got me talking about this kind of in the weeds is that Justin was asking, I think, about um, how if they have watertight skin, how that could mm -hmm. possibly work. And right. uh, the so answer is I did some digging and I don't know. <laughs> so I think that's the next part of the story is how do they facilitate gas exchange over what is supposed to be an impermeable layer? Yeah, that right. wasn't my question. Though. I think that was somebody in the chat room. Mine mm. was, uh, is this... Uh, is this because it's so close to the proximity of where oh that's that? that's right yes is this a conserved or uh, and a reintroduced from a conserved uh genetic uh expansion yes. you're right you're right yeah. so that also is a really great question and we could talk about this forever um my yeah, understanding good. is oh, that because of um, we, what I what we had talked about a little bit during that time was about uh, fetal development. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And the gill arches are a very particular part of fetal development that is conserved throughout vertebrates. And so it would be something that we could very easily watch happen in real time in snakes and see if these gill arches stay right where they are, if they turn into inner ear structures like in some vertebrates, or if they're migrating upward. I'm guessing that that's not the case. I'm guessing that those gill arches stay exactly where they are. And so in terms of at least the, the, the scaffolding structures, they would most likely have nothing to do with it. But in terms of genetic coding for development, that might be something worth looking at. And you're so, right, because sorry. it is so close. There could be something very interesting going on there. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would, to, to me, it's harder work to reinvent the same process in a, in pretty much the same location. Right. Uh, by re uh, starting from scratch. However, uh, so, if I can just yeah. say one last thing about that, yeah. this basic principle is at work in a lot of different mm -hmm. areas of nature. For example, how penguin feet work, how their feet don't freeze and fall off when they're standing in the snow and the ice is all yeah. based on this um, counter differential. Exchange. Yeah, counter yep. exchange. Exactly. And so mm -hmm. that's also how our kidneys work. So yeah. this basic chemical, if you want to call it biochemical process, is, is, is pretty consistent throughout um, evolution. And so I think that is not so difficult of a, a jump, especially since what makes gills gills are these little almost hair-like structures to increase surface area. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that on the snake's head. So, so it's just it's just like a venus that's just the veins the capillaries are yeah. thin and they're able to pick up this mm -hmm. diffused oxygen in the water yeah, yeah. so nice. i'm glad we could clear that up <laughs> all clear and please everyone feel free you know be nice about it but feel free <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if um, if I have a, a moment on the show. The show's live and, and things come out of our mouths sometimes that aren't quite right. It's, it's hard to be it happens to all of everything us. all the time. Okay, so moving on. Um, I have a couple of really cool stories about invasive species. And they're actually good news stories. Continuing on that good news thread from earlier. Um, so I think we've talked on the show before about cane toads. Cane toads are wreaking havoc all over the planet, a few places in particular, Australia, Hawaii, Florida. So cane toads have been introduced in a few different places. And uh, they're originally from Central America and South America. And they were brought in to eat um, some bugs that were on the sugar cane, hence cane toad, right? Um, and so they were brought in um, and they went on to eat everything but the locusts that they were brought in to eat. So basically this was a, a situation, this is basically the, the like textbook example of introduced species gone wrong. This animal is awake at a different time of day than the bug that they were brought in to eat. Hmm, how's that gonna work? Um, they can eat mice and lizards and other amphibians because they're so big. They can grow to be like eight inches big. Um, and so these animals have completely gone wild. The other reason they've gone wild is that they have a poison gland, a parotid gland that releases a very particular toxin um, that can kill animals. It can paralyze them or kill them. Uh, and so that in even small doses can kill potential predators, which means if you're not a predator that has grown up around cane toads, that has evolved around cane toads and has some sort of um, method for getting around or... Um, or surviving that toxin, there's no control on their population. And and there are there are such things that exist. Yes, there are there are things that can eat a cane toad yes. just fine from where it but, uh, originated. Yes. Yeah, but where it originated, just not right. everywhere else. So we right. need to introduce those everywhere else. <laughs> so we're running into trouble there, uh, but I do have some good news. Remember, I said so. This is from Australia, and um, this was a group of researchers who were looking through a very particular area. Um, so cane toads were introduced in around 1935 to Australia, and they've been spreading through the country at about 60 kilometers a year. 
uh, leaving devastation in their wake. They have all sorts of animals that have been dying en masse from trying to eat them, like northern quolls, yellow spotted monitors, crocodiles. All these animals have been dying off from trying to eat cane toads, which is a pretty big problem. Um, and then in around 2011, 2012, they arrived to a very particular field site in Western Australia, um, where they were seeing similar crashes in populations of lizards and quolls. And um, they there were researchers there that were kind of trying to monitor the decline of these species. And in 2014, they found a creek dotted with the bodies of cane toads, just cane toads everywhere, that had been attacked. Every morning, there were up to five new dead toads, and all of them had a near identical incision right down their chest in a five meter stretch um, of this creek. So um, they, they had this small incision, but only in this one very small area of this habitat. So was it um, a bunch of high school students? Is doing an entr entr Wait, yeah, is it an entrance wound or an exit wound? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> good question. So they did post-mortem analysis on all of these toads, and they found that the heart and liver had been removed, in addition to the gallbladder, which has toxic bile salts in it, that had the gallbladder had been moved outside of the chest cavity. So it was just kind of been moved off to the side, but the heart but and liver eaten. were gone, but not eaten. Uh, yeah. In the medium-sized toads, so that was just the large toads, the medium-sized toads, their heart and liver is removed, and one or both of their back legs had been stripped of toxic skin, and the muscle had been re eaten underneath it. This is like a weird serial killer. Yeah, <laughs> serial toad? Toad killer. Like, PSI, right? Right. We need yeah. like I need bones on the on the case. Come yeah, on. Yeah, they need to check out the blood splatter pattern and stuff. Right? So yeah. <laughs> the finding. Uh, brought them to, uh, aside from doing all this post-mortem on the toads, these researchers set up remote infrared cameras, as you do, um, and they found the native water rat. So the, the mm -hmm. Australia's water rat, rats, or Rakali, are one of Australia's beautiful but lesser-known native rats, and they have found a way to eat these toxic Because things. rats can learn! They can learn and they can communicate and pass on that knowledge, which is why sometimes mouse traps just stop stop working on them. Yes, and this is mm -hmm. this is where the hope of this story comes in because it's only in this very small stretch of Western Australia that this has happened. But in just two years of the cane toad living in this space, they have figured out how to hunt this poisonous toad and to um, dissect them, eat their hearts and livers, <laughs> avoid the poisonous skin, avoid yeah. the glands. Um, and so they actually have been able to figure out how to eat these things. Now, That's these amazing. water rats are specifically adapted to live in waterways. They have webbed feet, mm. they have soft water-resistant fur. Fun Ooh. fact, in Australia at one Web point, there was, there was a thriving water rat fur industry. So just think about that for a minute, that you might have your finest rat fur coat in Australia. At some yeah, it's point. Australia. It makes sense. Yeah, anyway. It's still post-apocalyptic. <laughs> um, so these guys, these very, very smart rats have figured out how to get around the poisonous nature of these toads. During the study, they captured and measured more than 1,800 cane toads in 15 days. So first thing about that. Mm -hmm. Um 94% of these toads were medium sized, 3.5% were small, and just 2.5% were large. So the medium toads are more common, but three quarters of the dead toads were large. Mm. The no rats like to kill toads. the big ones. Yes. No small toads were found or observed being attacked. So the small toads were not worth their time for all that work, right? They were only going for mostly large and some medium toads. Um, so they're not sure how the rats learned so rapidly how to safely attack and eat cane toads. One of their theories is that they have some other similar hunting strategy that they've used on other animals in the area that they now have been able to easily adjust to eat the toxic native frogs, but they are just not sure yet. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they're underestimating uh, the rat's ability to learn and share knowledge. I mean, this is this is well, a rat thing uh, across the 
Right, but I'm, I'm just thinking, so there's so many steps of learning that has to happen here. You have to go, oh, those toads are poisonous. Don't eat them. Larry died. Okay. <laughs> oh, those toads are poisonous, but only on their back and behind their eyes. Glenn died when he ate that part, but Susan didn't when she ate the legs. Yeah. And then, oh, the heart if of the we take this is the best part, right? So, like, And if we, and if we skin it, the muscle's just fine. <laughs> yeah. So I think there, there's so many steps there. It's possible. Rats are very, very smart. But it would be a much easier jump in just a two-year turnaround if that was the situation. So um, the really exciting part about this, though, is that, as Justin mentioned, they can pass on hunting strategies and they care for their offspring for a really long time for rats. About four weeks after they finish producing milk, the babies stick around and hang out with mom and dad. So this could help them spread knowledge. So yep. they say, oh, if these tactics spread, water rats might be able to help suppress toad populations. What I'm thinking is you take some surrogate moms and dads and you place them in other places where these water rats naturally live um, after they've shown this hunting strategy so that they can teach it to other groups of rats. Yeah, the, the, the really tricky part is, yeah, you need to make them foster parents for non-water rats. Yes. So that they can, that's <laughs> that tricky, helps. that's yeah. tricky, but yeah, that would, that would help, yeah. I mean, so in Australia, they also have this other thing going on, actually, might have been New Zealand, um, where, no, it's gotta be Australia because it's the cane toads. Um, they have been trying to teach wild quolls and other um, marsupials to stay away from the cane toads. So they've yeah, been don't using, touch them. yeah, they've been using negative reinforcement to try to um, give them some sort of adverse reaction, a loud so sound or, or something like that. Or actually, I think the most common one is flicking them with a rubber band. So really, people to save animals are hitting them with rubber bands to scare them away from toads. So <laughs> this sense. seems like this a much good. better version of that, but it's still very exciting. Um, it's good and, conditioning. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then my uh, last story for the corner tonight is about robots helping invasive species. Um, so this is coming out of NYU and um, mosquito fish, which are invasive species worldwide. Um, so there are still some places where they're supposed to be, but there are a lot of places where they're not supposed to be. Um, and they have been shown to show fear responses and stress responses uh, when you put them in a space with a robot version of a large mouth bass. <laughs> and, All right. Yeah. And so they've actually... Um, made a version of this robot that can kind of learn and adjust their tactics of chasing these mosquito fish around over time. And the more, um, the more realistic their behaviors are to the original largemouth bass, the more stressed out the mosquito fish appear, the more stressed out they are, the lower their body weight, the less successful their reproduction efforts are. And in theory that could help the population, uh, reduce the population of this invasive species. Um, the one thing they don't mention though, in this article, I will bring up, um, what if anybody else who's native gets scared by these robotic largemouth bass that their entire job is to scare you? Just a thought. All right. How does it, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be a laboratory situation if you're taking them out into the wild, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's all well and good for the mosquito fish, but to scare them away. But um, for a fake animal that, you know, a predator is scary because it's hungry, it doesn't hunt all the time. And so if you throw a robot in there that's acting like it's hunting all the time, that could really stress out animal populations that are not your intended target as well. And aren't there other, I mean, there's, there have got to be better solutions for the mosquito fish than scary largemouth bass. Yeah, I don't know. Or, I mean, or is this something like, uh, I mean, are rivers so uh, undiverse? I mean, we have in cities to get rid of the crows, you know, the, the hawk that they fly around town to scare the crows away. So that they don't uh, roost over the cars and do all that kind of stuff. So we do this kind of naturally without robots in some situations, and it seems to work very well. So yeah. it, I don't know. It could work. But it, yeah, yeah, what? Robots? 
Yeah. Well, and and plus you have to deal with the really angry uh, fisher people, fishermen, fisherwomen, who uh, accidentally pull up a robotic largemouth bass. <laughs> You'd hope that would not happen. Can't eat Absolutely. that for dinner. <laughs> this robot's not going to cook up well. No. Might as well go have some tea. Tea? Tea. <gasps> well, if you're British, maybe you'll have a cuppa. Uh, the cup of tea researchers just have reported finding microscopic plastic particles in tea, according to the American Chemical Society's Environmental Science and Technology. Researchers looked at uh, these these new fangled bags that are, you know, you could buy a tea and there's like the silky bags. Mm -hmm. and they, well, they're not necessarily silk. They're usually a kind of plastic, actually. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. And so using electron microscopy, the team found that at brewing temperature, a single plastic bag released about 11.6 billion microplastic particles and 3.1 billion nanoplastic <laughs> particles into the water. This is really high, thousands of times higher than other reports for different kinds of food. They treated water fleas, Daphnia magna, with the plasticky nanoparticle and microparticle water. And the animals survived, but they did have some abnormalities, I guess is so. They weren't they weren't exactly normal. So we don't know how this would affect you health-wise. We don't know how the, the plastics actually affect people. There's no sense whether or not they do at all. But if you're using tea bags, I don't know, you might use a, use a metal spoon and make your own tea or buy tea with a paper bag. Yeah, can we just stop putting plastic on food on items that don't need them? Especially food items that are going to be just sunk into extremely hot water, which is a recipe for the breakdown of a substance and the release of particles. I mean, it's just like there's a, anyway. So, yeah. So really, anytime you put uh, anytime you put it into uh, something that's got plastics uh, into solution of water, you're going to run into this problem. Pretty much. Uh, I mean, or hot water, if you're putting, I'm, yeah. It doesn't right. necessarily need to or be Or the hot microwave, water. or, I mean, there are all or sorts of. Or your laundry. Or yeah. your laundry, yeah. 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 And, it, and it, turns out, it turns out it's not necessarily water temperature, and it's not necessarily agitation uh, within a wash cycle. In fact, it's the volume of water used. And, and the duration that makes a bigger impact. Uh, according to uh, recent research done on uh, the delicate wash cycle in your washing machine uh, by researchers at Newcastle University, they show that the delicate cycle, which tends to use less agitation and more water in the wash cycle to protect the clothes from getting agitated or scraped by the agitation in any way, uh, actually releases more microfibers than a standard cycle because of, simply because of the volume of the water. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, you know, this is, this is going to keep coming up uh, over and over and over again that we, we need to stop putting plastic and things that get in contact with water. And I think that's I think that's going to essentially be the thing. If there's water involved, plastic can no longer be. Water bottles, no. Uh, you know, sippy cup. I mean, we had to remove uh, bisphenol A from all of these things at some point because yeah. they were also leaching out plastics. Mm -hmm. Anything in the plastics and connection to water combination, it's going to leach out. And yeah. you know, the, the other thing about that too is the. Uh, the, the more water that we use uh, is also a bad thing. So using less water, this is kind of a nice aspect of this. Using less water uh, will release less microplastics from our fibers. Uh, so you might consider one of these front load washing machines that uses reduced water in the first place and has no agitator 
so if we're using less water, there'll be less microplastics into the environment that way as well. Uh, yeah, this is a, just another place that we have to look at how all these microplastics are ending up in the ocean. So many places. What about ways that wasps end up taken in as victims? <gasps> Uh, last quick story for me for the hour, for the two hours, is a story about Crypt Keeper wasps. These what? are wasps that they take. They're, they're pretty awesome. They create the galls oh, yeah. on oh, yeah. oak trees. Mm -hmm. So they will, uh, a wasp, Euderis Set, will uh, take the gall that has been created by other species of wasps. So another, like a, a common victim is known as the Bassettia pallida wasps. And so they lay their eggs in the stems and branches of the oak trees and you get the swollen bumps and the galls. And so the crypt keeper wasp comes in, digs in, lays her eggs in the gall with the other wasps' eggs. The larvae camp out there next to the hatchlings that are there and burrow into their bodies. And when the hatchling of... The prey species, the victim, is ready to chew its way out and get out of the gall. The crypt keeper somehow, and they don't know how the crypt keeper does it, but the crypt keeper makes the host chew a hole in the gall that's too small for them to get out so their head gets stuck. <laughs> and they're stuck. And then they're not going anywhere, so they become food for the larva for the crypt keeper wasp. And so then when the crypt keeper wasp larva are grown and they want to leave the gall, well, of course, they just chew right out through the host's head because that's the easiest exit point. It's softer than eating out through bark of a tree. Cool, 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 cool. cool. So anyway, the new news here is that researchers publishing in Biology Letters, they looked at 23,000 galls. And they found that they contained over a hundred different species of oak gall wasps. And they found that the crypt keepers were parasitizing six different species of wasps. And so they're not, they, and they were parat they parasitized out of these 23,000 galls, 305 wasps from these six different species. So they don't focus, the crypt keepers don't focus on. Yeah one species of these gall producing wasps they're not picky they are pretty much just gonna you've got there's a gall i'm gonna put my larva in there yeah and which they, means their their mind control compounds are pretty broad broad exactly and not yeah. not specific the one thing that they don't like in a gall are galls that are covered in fur or spikes hmm Good reason to uh, get that wrap fur coat from Australia. You yeah. Boys there you go. <laughs> exactly. Oh, wasps with galls. Put a little wrap fur coat on there. Avoid <laughs> your crypt keepers. <laughs> Last story, Blair. Yes. Um, your cat likes you. <laughs> so many people. <gasps> what? I so many does. people sent this story to me, and I just love it that somebody decided at Oregon State University um, to use their um, secure base test, which is um, a space where they have um, humans and cats interacting with each other in a spatial environment and seeing their response to one another. They had all these behavioral scientists studying it as it was happening. Um, they they did the same test that they've done in the past with dogs, who everyone assumes is very connected to their owner, right? And with infants, definitely connected to their parent. Um, I did not say owner. <laughs> it was close. <laughs> it was close. Right. Um, well, anyway, uh, the thing is, you're measuring for two different categories of responses out of kittens or dogs or infants, securely attached or insecurely attached. And the ratio of secure attachment around 65% to insecure attachment, approximately 35%, was consistent among cats, dogs, and infants, which means your cat is just as likely to be attached to you as a dog or a child is. Duh. Yeah. Duh, for sure. Duh. 
Yeah, but with, <laughs> with the leverage behind it of you are their source of food. Now, for the dog. For a I dog, dog also, for a child also, yeah, it's yeah, all. Right, right. Wait, 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 wait. For a child. I Social think structure is important. Yeah. We're just going to. Yes, yes. I think for dogs and, and infants, uh, the social structure is a very important compound to this. My cat I likes think, me for more I than just for the food. Cat, it's purely nope. strategic. Well, so the eat. problem with that, though, Justin, I don't is that think so so. Many cats are grazers and they just have food out all the time, which means they don't need a pet from you to get yeah. their food. Yeah, in fact, in some cases, there. dogs are more dependent on coming to you and seeking attention in order to get a treat or their dinner. And so cats in some ways have less food based motivation to seek out interaction with you than uh, than dogs do. So just marking their territory. My cats love me. My cats, they I, I will be down here in the basement and the cats, I will hear them go meow, 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 and they come running down the stairs meow, 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 and they have this little meowy head. sound. No, and they come down and they've got a little toy mouse in their, in their mouth and then they drop it at my feet and they go and they meow at me and then they get pets and yeah so, oh, and so so just they brought me a dead high. mouse they're, they're yeah, helping me that means they're they me. love you so they love me last little bit of clarification just because i know justin wants to hear some hard science here um is that this is a real behavioral measurement of whether um they are using a human as a source of security um yeah. in a situation that they are unfamiliar in and so in the grand majority of cats um, in this case, the same percentage as infants and dogs, the cats showed behavior that their owner was a source of security for them. So they tested their behavior in this room, first, both of them going in together, the cat being left alone for a while, and then the human coming back. And based on that interaction specifically, they felt that they could measure that there was this secure relationship between the cat and the human. Yeah. I have a secure relationship with my cats. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. And you know what? That's all we all need to know this week. Well, that's not true. There's so much more to know. I hope these stories tonight led you to ask more questions and maybe maybe you're going to go look something up. Maybe you're already looking something up because of our conversations tonight, because of the stories that we had. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have come to the end of another show. And now I would love to give shout outs to our wonderful volunteers who help us out. Identity 4 for recording the show. Thank you so much. Gordon McLeod in the chat room. Thank you. Fada for helping us with the show notes and the show descriptions and the social media. Thank you for all these things. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors which, of course, I didn't put all the things in the right place, and it's going to take me. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm looking for a click in the links. I'll get there in five, four, three, two. Thank you to Paul Disney, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Andy Grow, Ed Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison pra Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K, Bob Calder, Time Chipper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan K, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, Gr John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Drapode, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Randy Garcia, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Merida Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Click the Patreon link at twist.org. Remember, you can help Twist out by telling us. Telling us, telling your friends about us. 
On next week's show, we will be back once again with more science news for you, broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room, but don't worry if you can't make it. You can find past episodes on YouTube or there at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science anywhere in your iTunes type device and it should pop right up. Uh, or in anywhere, Apple Marketplace. Apple's got us covered. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Yes, or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twists somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, your email will be, what is it, Blair? Spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit up hit us up on Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes through in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Uh, and if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in 
would be the end of another show that would be the end of another show we did it don't you know we've come to the end my dear science friends the end of another twist show oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so i was just looking at my agenda for next week since i'll be in churchill gosh Darn it. My memory. Okay. So I was just looking My and I was drive. like, hold oh. on, hold on. I'm going to the run sheet right now. Okay. And I'm going to cross you off. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause I was like, oh, maybe I'll try to Skype in. Like they, they want us to be doing media outreach while we're there. So that wouldn't that be great. And then I was looking, I was like, what is Wednesday? Of course. Wednesday night is the night that we are staying in the Tundra Lodge, which is the converted oh, train. So, so cool. we are all in bunk beds in one space. That's and not gonna work. lights out is at nine, which is seven here. <laughs> <laughs> because we're heading out onto the tundra at seven the next day. Oh my, that's so exciting. So um, oh my goodness. It does not sound like uh, there's any way I'd be able to be here. <laughs> no, it does not. So. And I may not have a Justin either. I what? Go get... Well, depending on, I don't know. I mean, Justin's oh, yeah, probably going to be fine know. with the Chrome, but I don't know what's going on. Yeah. So I just have to be ready for anything because I know Justin probably won't tell me until like, I mean, five minutes before the show. Well, honestly, is he? Did he first is he? fully leave? No, no. I okay. took him off the stream because he went away. But yeah. if he comes, he's still there. So if he, if if and when he comes back, yeah. Because I, I mean, that would be good to know now, so that you could cancel the show. <laughs> no, no, no. I won't cancel the show. I mean, it'll just be like, oh, I'm gonna get some other. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to hire new co-hosts. Oh, no. <laughs> what a, a teaching climate change <laughs> communication. Uh, it's not just fun. Oh. oh, wait. Did I swear? I don't did think I... you swore. Kevin Unique in the chat room is like, Dr. Kiki swearing. Am I swearing? Did I swear? I don't remember hearing you swear. Maybe I did. Sometimes words come out like, Marshall every once in a while he's like I don't know what people know about you but you your mouth you swear like a sailor so it's very possible yeah, yeah. Who knows? yeah. finally we get rid of Blair and Justin oh, ha, ha, no. ha, ha. yes hot rod <laughs> oh, no. that's right Kai has been begging for a spot on the show I explained Gil's wrong and then I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. No more mistakes, Blair. Just got <laughs> kicked to the curb. No, um, I... Actually, speaking of that, um, I have a call with the woman in charge of Polar Bears International and like this whole thing tomorrow who um, wanted to discuss maybe doing some sort of Facebook live event from there mm. in conjunction with Twist. So if you're interested... <laughs> We could I mean, do a little would, short. Yeah, we could do a we could do a Twitch stream. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I could probably schedule something next week. Yeah, or this. I don't know. Whatever, yeah. whatever is best. I'll be on a iPad. Yeah, we could probably, but that's fine. Yeah. Would it be? It would be the two of you. I don't know. I there. I, I, I doing a we'd live be thing? there, but we'd okay. be. Um, I have to talk to her about the schedule and when it would make sense. Yeah. Um, but if I just wanted to check in and see if you were interested before totally. I talk totally. to her about it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, so and we'll I just think, put it on the calendar and do a Twitch stream or something. Yeah. So basically every day we're going to be talking to multiple, um, Arctic researchers, people who research belugas, polar bears, just, you know, ice, <laughs> all that I good stuff. It. Um, oh and goodness. so we'll have all those people or it might just be her and I discussing, um, what we're doing up there. 
Right. So when are you going to be back? Depends. I won't be back until the ninth. I'm I'm arriving just a few short hours before our show. Oh boy. Yeah. So you might do two weeks off. That's not the plan. <laughs> that would that would happen if I got delayed terribly. Okay. But I'm supposed Good to be enough. back in time. The SFO construction will be long done by then. So I should not, fingers crossed, knocking on all the wood, have any trouble yeah. getting back for okay. the show. And I'm going to do all my prep in the airports on the day. So I should be able to just... Oh, yeah. Right. There's Wi-Fi in airports. Yes. <laughs> Eric in Alaska says, hey, Blair, dress warm. So here's the thing is that it's this super is hot like there right now. the best. Well, it's not hot, but this is definitely one of the best times of year to go. So in Winnipeg, which is where I'm first flying to, and I have some days at the beginning at the end that are in Winnipeg. Um, it's right now the high is like mid to high 50s and the low is mid 30s to mid 40s. So pretty reasonable, although a little rainy. Um Churchill, uh, ooh, there is some snow happening tomorrow. That's fun. Um, and Friday. But there's no snow the whole time I'm there. And it is a high of like 40 and a low of like 30. So uh, <laughs> actually not that bad. Not that bad, but that's cold. It's like New York cold. Yeah. It's not like, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, Wisconsin it's not... cold. Yes. Yeah. That's I get to go to Madison, Wisconsin in November. Oh no! I'm just, I'm just not even looking at that because I don't even. I just don't know what I'm supposed to do there. <laughs> I don't even think I have a jacket that can handle that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> luckily they're providing us with parkas. That's part of the deal. Is when we when we uh, onboard after our day in Winnipeg in preparation for taking our little biplane to Churchill. Um, then they they check out a uh, a down parka to each of us. For the That's wonderful the trip. I'm pretty excited, but they are like, don't even bother bringing snowshoes. It's not going to be <laughs> snowing that heavy. It's not going to be that cold. Um, just bring some nice hiking boots, and you'll be bring good. your thermal underwear too. I I'm bringing some long underwear, but I also have some flannel lined jeans, and they were like, "That's also fine. It's not that cold." Yeah, no, if the sun's out all the the time, it'll probably be in the range of the 40s. 40s. Yeah, so it's 30s to 40s pretty much the whole yeah. time. We just had... It'll be fine. It's not really... It's close As to the, the answer autumnal is... equinox, isn't it? Yeah, the yeah. autumnal equinox was Monday. Yeah. Autumnal? Autumnal. autumnal. Somebody didn't see the Shouty Blair tweet. <laughs> I missed it. I One of it. my... It's so funny that that was one of my best received tweets I've ever tweeted. And it was simply here. I want to, I want to quote it properly. Um, it was the following shout. It was hot take. I prefer autumnal equinox to fall equinox. It is much more fun to say. <laughs> it's a good hot take. So. Oh, I, so wisdom from Kai, the ch children's wisdom is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I put it on Twitter, but this week it was hilarious. He's in the shower and I hear I'm in the other room and I hear him, him say, Daddy, do you ever think that you get look fatter when you're in the shower? And I hear I hear Marshall say, uh, what? No. No, are you just looking down at your belly more? Like you're looking down, and that's just it. Look, it looks that way. And Kai goes, thinks about it. Hmm. No, I think it's thermal expansion. <laughs> yep. yep, yep, yep. That <laughs> makes sense. <That's> good. <laughs> like thermal expansion in the shower. It was good. Yeah, oh, yeah. There yes. we go. I mean, there you go. Oh my gosh, I can't wait for your trip. You're gonna have like thermal contraction next week. You're gonna be like, I'm so cold in the snow. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Um so next week 
Yes. Yeah. Let me know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Are, you're uh, here, yes. Justin. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Okay. This, uh, the only thing I was really worried about uh, was this setup. So this is this is the camera that uh, I didn't have set up before. The one uh, I sent you many many moons ago. Yeah. Uh, but it was just inconvenient to set up in the previous setup. So that's what's operating now. This awesome. uh, microphone is the old one that they used to do the show with. So I don't uh, think it's cool. picking up that sound at all. Just so you know, you, I think it's picking think it's, up. Yeah. I think it's the camera maybe. Oh, has it been this yeah. whole time? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to. So we can probably do better audio. We can maybe figure yeah. that out. Yeah. Cause you've been pretty like, echoey. And uh, yeah, I think that's why. Yeah, you just no, turned right. it around and it's a directional mic and it didn't change the way you sounded at all. At oh, all. Okay. Oh, you're right. It's not on. I thought it was set. Now I can't hear you at all. Nope. Yeah. For a second, I, will, I should oh, be quiet. Wait. But wait. Now, now you're on the mic. Be, now I'm on. T -t 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 -t. Okay. All right. It's so, still uh, echoey because you're kind of in a big, big empty room, it's aren't a you? Giant empty house now. Uh, so, <laughs> so actually, then uh, it seems, seems like either mic will be fine. Uh, yeah. Camera works. I have my main concern actually was uh, whether or not I could get all these components in and be able to dial in to the uh, the platform here. And yeah. all of that seems to have worked. That was the only thing. All of this is coming with, so it's beautiful. You're good. Yeah, it'll be good. When are you leaving? Saturday. Night. You are. Like flying the coop walkabout Saturday. Uh, Saturday night, I am boarding Norwegian Air 787, leaving Oakland direct. Wow. Yeah. That's so fun. I do not have a direct flight on Saturday to Winnipeg. <laughs> no, you Winnipeg don't. Winnipeg is uh, a tiny airport. <laughs> which, by the way, I'm just going to point out for any future booking of flights, uh, it, the, the flight from Oakland to Denmark will take less time than my flight from uh, New Mexico. Yeah. To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an odd one. That to was, Sacramento. Yeah, that yeah. was that was that was three flights. It turned out oh that gosh. took half of my life. Half of your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're like is, i could have just driven to san francisco and I, left I, from san been, francisco and been yeah, home sooner yeah for real um <laughs> but yeah norwegian air i can't i've never been on a 787 before Ooh. this is one of those Ooh, double decker that's big. Airplanes. Yeah. oh i've been on one of those cool yeah, I'm, I'm very excited uh, when i flew back from europe in like 2007 i want to say I was on never, never I've been on uh, some big planes, but not not uh, not one of these. So very nice. That's fun. Yeah. That's awesome. So you're leaving Saturday, Blair. You head out on Monday. Saturday. Saturday. Both yeah. of you are heading. I want to go somewhere on Saturday. Yeah. Ooh. I leave at eight a.m., so I have to be at the airport at like six thirty. Yeah. I think early. I leave at eight p.m. Yeah. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, you guys are going to have such exciting trips and you're off on adventures. I love that. I love that. Okay, so next week, no Blair. Yeah. But one, Justin says 100%. 100%. Uh, right. It'll be a little bit. I think, I think the show starts at... Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, how's that going to work for you? It's are you really... Hard. It's gonna be early. I think it's four thirty in the morning. Is when I have to wake up. I don't know. I gotta do. Um, um, Norway is nine hours ahead of time. I'm not okay. I'll be in oh. Denmark, but same You'll thing. Be in nine Denmark. hours. Nine hours. Nine hours. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it'll be. Oh, that's not too bad. It'll be five a.m. Five a.m. So I'll be up at four thirty uh, preparing the show. That's better than when I was in Israel. <laughs> it have to be the night before. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be up at 4.30 making coffee. Uh -huh. so this is actually kind of interesting. So we've been doing the end of the night shows for a very long time, uh, which I, I think is a very different Justin. I think I'm quieter uh, by the time the evening has settled in. Uh, four, five o'clock in the morning, Justin, who's had two cups of coffee, hopefully uh, by that time, 
completely different Justin. Uh, this is, is going to be kind of fun to see how that plays out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was It'll crazy. be a highly caffeinated, uh, fresh brain, uh, which is which is always dangerous. You're gonna get the jump on us. Although, yeah. I don't know me, five a.m. Not so yeah. quick. <laughs> oh no, that's coffee. that's, that's yeah. just in prime time. Yeah. yeah. So that's I'm realizing um, when I did my broadcast from Israel, it was when we still technically started at seven thirty. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, that was yeah, three thirty. Well, so half of the time I was there, it was nine hours ahead, I think, and so that was um, four thirty. Mm-hmm. So I was you got up at like four, three thirty. Three thirty. Yeah, I don't remember. And then yeah, it was ten hours ahead for half of the time, so that meant it was five thirty. Yeah. Oh, time differences. All right. All right, Justin, you can do this next week. You can yeah, do Justin, it. Justin, you got you got to carry carry my half of the show. Okay. Uh <laughs> Justin's Animal Corner. I'll bring yeah. it. Yeah. No yeah. problem. <laughs> I'm good at that. I know yeah. uh like five or six things it. about animals. It's just going to be cat bashing yeah, the whole yeah. time. Yeah, like this. This is why science <laughs> says cats suck. <laughs> <laughs> Justin's animal corner with cats, <laughs> <laughs> but indoor cats or on a leash. Oh my goodness, uh, Blair! Did you send out the um, newsletter? I sure did. You did. I need to contribute to that one of these days. Yeah, you yeah. do. Uh, that would be great. Okay. All right. I'll get on that. Um, and, and if that's <laughs> if, if if I can do that on a semi consistent basis. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing, Justin. You can bank stuff. You can like start a doc and and invite me to contribute to it and just put stuff in it and I'll plug it in when I make a newsletter. You don't have to wait for me to ask you for stuff. Okay. Just like put musings in there. Just drop them in and I'll pull from them. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, and then the, something that, uh, well, yeah. Uh, send me a link to, uh, no, I can share a doc with you. I can, I'm that comfortable. Just better. I'll, I'll start banking. I'll, I'll start a, uh, is there. I mean, I'm sure people would love to hear about like your trip to Denmark, what yeah. you, you know, things you see. Oh, no. Next newsletter, I'm sure no, no, no. people will love to hear about Blair's trip uh-huh. to the Alaska. Yeah. 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 That, that I, have we'll to, I have to write about that for my day job anyway. So it'll be an easy thing to just kind of double dip. Um, but uh, Justin, you could also at some point give us an update on the school bus. Oh, uh, yeah. It's Somebody not... asked for that actually in the newsletter. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, the, I, I mean the newsletter. I... Yeah, the newsletter is a place that we can write down things that we're thinking about that people might be interested in knowing about what we're working on, things we've mentioned, what we're doing. Yeah, my uh, so I've got a uh, couch uh, installed. Oh, cool. Uh, well, in there, and and I also have my old desk uh, from the show. Uh, I found a spot there. It's not uh, really, really installed yet, but it's in there. It's in. Uh, and I think I just found a new home. Sweet. So the uh, the Justin end of the twist travel desk is now on wheels. Yeah. Uh, the 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 first steps in the studio bus. Uh, studio bus. Yeah. I love it. It's awesome. Studio bus on the road. Mm-hmm. With Justin. With science. With science. Science on the road road. with science. Um, There we go. Hit the road with some science. Yeah. All right. I think I'm exhausted. I don't know why. Oh, I have been. I I moved the house. I don't know what's going on. I have way too much stuff. Yeah, (gasps) don't we all? (laughs) You do. So much stuff. I I did the thing where I got like the biggest storage unit that they had available at the storage place. And mm-hmm. then I moved stuff in there, and then I'm like, okay, what's right. the smallest one you've got? Because <laughs> like, yeah, I need just another like 25 square oh, feet. Oh no! 
no. Oh, no. <laughs> two. That's too much stuff. It's way too much stuff. I'm one person. That's too crazy. I mean, I get that. You're like one person, but you're, I mean, you've had a house. You've had, you know, you've been, you've had. It's you, not all my stuff. Yeah, You've I mean, lived a whole you've life got, also. You've got <laughs> kids and there's, I've yeah. I've got kids stuff. I got my stuff. There's. It's that's the thing is sorts. like, yeah, I mean, when, when I began cohabitating, it definitely felt like we had way too much stuff. And I feel like it's because, you know, we were in our thirties when we moved in together, which meant like. That was at least 10 years of adulthood of acquiring stuff where Thanks. you didn't share space with other people, mm -hmm. right? So, like, it's very different from if you if you live with somebody starting when you're 24, you've, you've acquired a lot less just basic crap, right? Like, it definitely felt like there was just, we all had, we had two of so many things. Yeah. Like, you know, we're still working through it. Amazingly, I have a tremendous amount of kitchen stuff. I, I I think like half of my storage unit is kitchen appliances and things. That's, yeah, the, for somebody should, who eats out, some of that on on eBay. Four out of so five many days. appliances. I'm like, ah, maybe if I just buy some kitchen stuff, I'll start cooking on a more just, frequent. Justin, no. wait until um. Well, now it's kind of far away, but move in day at the Davis campus, and uh, just set up a table. <laughs> Yeah, You're the dorm. You I feel there like you'd you be like 20 bucks for this, 30 bucks for that, five bucks for that. You can get rid of a lot of stuff. Oh, my oh gosh, and, yeah. and for the international students, I could also, uh, I could sell Except uh, pounds? can oh. openers and explain how to use them. There you go. A lot of countries, you, you think we take they it for the, granted. You do the thing and you just turn. Yeah, they got like all sorts yeah. of yeah. primitive <laughs> prehistoric devices for opening cans. Yeah. Which is funny because they were invented before cans were. It's, it's a, one of those weird things where they're. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll see you Blair. both. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night everyone. Yeah. Two. Everyone, two. wish wish our twist our twist family some good travels there's some sure. good traveling that's going on uh october 1st we will be uh starting the three month 50 dollars patreon you get a framed piece of blair art if you're a 50 dollars patreon supporter for three months that starts october 1st and uh we just had a new newsletter out check your email if you haven't gotten that and we'll be i will be here next week hopefully justin will be here next week it's a hundred it's a hundred. What's the caveat? It's a hundred. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're in. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'm tired. I'm sure you are, too. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>